She's a Pulitzer-nominated journalist and producer who is a woman to follow. Rose Horowitz has reported on uncomfortable stories that expose the truth. Her series on the corruption of the U.S. Food for Peace program earned her a Pulitzer nomination and created the groundwork for legislative change. She was the first to expose Captain Hazelwood of Exxon Valdez's drunk driving record. She uncovered an exclusive story about, a, about the U.S. Merchant Marine at the start of the Gulf War. Besides her journalism feats, she founded and hosts the Women to Follow podcast and has appeared in Forbes, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and much more. She has produced and co-hosts shows with high-profile guests, including the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Maria Ressa. Please welcome Rose Horowitz. Hi, Deb. It's great to be here. A pleasure to, what an introduction. You did your homework. You got to the heart of it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So when you were a kid, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? I always like to write poetry. At eight years old, I think I had a poetry anthology. Then at 10, I edited the Horowitz family newspaper. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Your so, family had a newspaper. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a reporter for Variety at the time. And I remember going with him to the Variety newsroom, which was, you know, in Broadway area. And like, it was very old school, but I don't know why I always liked to write. And so I started this family newspaper and I had like a few stories and I had want ads. Mom wants everybody to clean their room and things like that. So I guess it was something I always thought about. What was your first job in media? My first job after I went to college and I majored in English and then I went to graduate school. And after, as I was finishing up graduate school, like two weeks before the Associated Press editor in Pittsburgh called me and said, hey, Rose, you know, it's Pete Matisse here. What are you up to? So I got a job. I had done an internship at the AP and I took a writing test and uh, how to write a sports story, a breaking news story, a feature. And there were some grammatical kinds of questions. And so I got put on the list. They had a roster for summer relief writers. I moved to Pittsburgh and lived there for three months and opened up the bureau and was doing writing for radio for like the noon show, you know, noon radio stations. I did that in Charleston, West Virginia. And then eventually I started at a paper in New York City, that a business paper called the Journal of Commerce that was owned at the time by Knight Ritter. So who was your media mentor? My media mentor. I would say when I, when I worked at the Journal of Commerce, I was always getting scoops and there was an editor there. And remember there weren't that many women, female reporters. And there was one editor who called me in one day and said, well, Rose, like you're always on the front page. And I thought like, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, right? So this managing editor who they hired saw my potential and there was a envelope that went through the door under the door of the newsroom that you couldn't identify who it was and he said check this out and I did and that developed into the series that I wrote about food for peace mm -hmm. and he so I was put on a three-month solo assignment to uncover what this was about uh, I would say his name is Bob Frump and he's now well, anyway, he's had a long career, but he had been part of a team that won Pulitzer's under Gene Roberts at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Wow. Wow. So I would say that of everybody in media, you know, that I've known, he would be the one I learned the most from. When did you first actually look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm a journalist? <laughs> In college, I volunteered to be, there were two competing newspapers at Queens College, which is part of the CUNY system. So very unbelievable that there would be two papers. And I volunteered, you know, I became a reporter and, they, and I loved it. I remember I covered an exhibit of Da Vinci at MoMA and I covered a costume exhibit at the Met. My writing professor at the time read it and liked how 
observant I was and about the details. In college, I also liked international affairs. And so I did that internship at AP, but then in graduate school, I was a media major. So we covered one of the primaries in New Hampshire. And I guess the first printed story I did was for the New Hampshire, the Amsterdam News covering New York primary. Once I started in college, I did an internship at the AP and did that story for Amsterdam News and was majoring in graduate school in international media because I'd gone to the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. I think I looked in the mirror and said, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist. Okay. Did you ever think about becoming a war correspondent or working in a conflict zone? I did love the idea of going overseas. I was part of a fellowship with the Japan-U.S. society. I went to Japan for, at the time, Japan-U.S. trade news was everywhere. And I went as part of a team of 10 reporters from the U.S. and 10, and 10 from Japan came to America. And then we met at the end of these three weeks at the University of Hawaii's East-West Center. So I did reporting in Japan. I interviewed a farmer about beef. I went to a wedding venue to see how they do weddings. I was reporting, but I, I never did become a foreign correspondent, although I did many stories about some of the stories I broke also were about trade with the Soviet Union and business businesses who were gearing up to. I did a story that <laughs> found out that the U.S. embassy was, which we knew was bugged. But I found a group of US, New York business people who were trying to buy it. And the story <laughs> went out. And Thomas Friedman of the New York Times at the State Department said, there's that Rose Horowitz wrote, reported XYZ. Even though I wasn't abroad, I was covering international trade and shipping at the Journal of Commerce. So I would go and hear the minister, the prime minister of Argentina. But I never did, whenever I got married, I never did make it to become a foreign correspondent. I don't know if I really wanted war correspondent, more the experience of, of living in another country and mm -hmm. reporting from there. I think that would have been great. And I got that a little bit with this trip to Japan and, yeah. and then being part of going to international trade shows. And I did meet many people from abroad. I did write a story as we were going to the Persian Gulf for Forbes. That was the first story, the only story they had in that issue as we went into the Persian Gulf. But it was about the U.S. has a merchant marine. So it was about how it was called the Rusty Reserve. <laughs> so it was kind of an expose saying how bad our ships were. And here we were going, you know, to war and we would not have these ships were so old they could leak and things like that. Wow. So I guess you can cover world affairs from anywhere right yeah and, e and even then I could do it from New York City what was your favorite story did you have a favorite I guess the favorite would be the story that I did on on the U.S. food for peace because it was really interesting I had undercover sources I had a deep what they call it, deep throat in Washington who worked for one of the agencies and was wanted to see change. So he was giving me information and was a source and I would call under an alias and I would go to Washington and meet him, you know, at different places. And with that story, which exposed how middlemen shipping, not shipping companies, but the middlemen, like the brokers were, there was one company that was getting all the rates because when you ship food for food for peace, it, it, there's a U.S. law that it has to go on U.S. owned ship with U U.S. flagships. Hmm. And another person was complaining about that, another broker. And then I did all this research, traced ships, and that story resulted in the Foreign Relations Committee holding hearings about the way the U.S. bidding was run. So it went from being, and laws changed from a closed bidding process to an open bidding process. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of reporting and having a change like that, I would say was the most concrete, you know, like to have done that and cause change that to me is really, was really meaningful. 
That's quite an um, honor too, right? That's yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> yes. And one, in addition to like the, the story being nominated for a Pulitzer, I won an AP Managing Editors Award and World Hunger Year, I won an award. I mean, in terms of the most interesting person that I've interviewed, I would say Maria Ressa, oh, yeah. who won the Nobel Prize, was amazing and just so full of energy. I mean, she was, I interviewed her as she was sort of under house arrest. Well, I said, how do you do that? You know, how do you still run a business and report the way, you know, you're reporting on the Philippine government under du Duterte, who was a dictator? And she said, you know, there's a glass. And I just say, it's half, it's full. It's half full. And I just keep going and just do what I have to do. And like nothing stops her. And she was just this bundle of great energy. That was one of the people. And another would be, I interviewed a survivor of the Holocaust. Oh, wow. Who, who was going to speak at a synagogue. And they asked me to do a story to help that would help her publicize the event. And in doing that, I interviewed her in her home and she was amazing. Like she had been in, she went before Mengele. I mean, the story she told oh, wow. and her resilience and she was such a vibrant person. Like in her seventies, she was playing tennis with younger people every, every few days. She just was so full of life. that It was amazing that she had gone through what she did and live to to be seen such a happy person and she but what was interesting you never you know and this is like the reporter in me when I got arrived at her house and and my son who was in high school at the time was taking photographs she was wearing a black and white striped sweater wow. and when we went to take the photographs I thought oh you know but I didn't I mean what can I say I didn't say anything but she showed me her number. Uh, but to hear that, like, right up close and to hear how... To see, um, it. <clears throat> to see it on someone's arm, yes. Yeah, yeah, but to hear her story of going before Mengele, losing her mother, you know, she knew she had to do that. And, like, somebody pushed her at her. She was in the line and her mother pushed her to the line, which meant she was not going to be with her mother. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, one line was going, what you know, that whole thing. And she just broke down and cried because she thought... Her mother didn't love her somehow, but she, the mother had a younger sibling who wasn't going to be able to work. And she said a Nazi guard found her in the bathroom, hysterical, and said, you have to go in line. And she did. Okay. And so she got set to a work camp initially. But to hear those moments, that is part of the joy of being a journalist of hearing those moments that really changed people and seeing their story of struggle and seeing what they do to survive. In the case of Maria Ressa, and then in the case yeah. of this woman and I don't know how many hundreds of other women I've yeah, interviewed. Yeah, her, her story is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the medium of journalism has changed quite a bit, thanks to cable news as well. and. What do you, and with technology, what do you see as some of the positive changes? Positive changes are the ability for people to tell their story without the filter of news of what was what we call legacy publications. It's also a danger, but also there's a beauty in that. So that, for example, I was at an event uh, after, on the New York Public Library held by PEN America. And they had a, poets and writers speaking about the election and what happened. This was after, in 2016. So Rita Dove read a poem. She is a, was a poet laureate of the U.S. And it was really moving. So I was taking video. And then I said, huh, you know, like I should. And then there was a chorus that sang. And I said, ah, I'm going to put out a tweet. And I was able on my, just with my phone, to do all of that, to check what song this choir was singing, what was the name of the choir, what Rita Dove's handle, but she was actually on Twitter. And I put out the clip and it got hundreds of views and the person who was leading Penn, like, said hello to me. So that is a beauty that 
everyone in a way, I don't call that citizen journalism, but I think that it's a way to tell your story mm -hmm. and that because of technology, we can do that, go directly to people with our story or what we yeah. want to get people it's, to know. It's so different now than it was when I started. It is, yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the worst things that you see about these, these changes? Uh, where shall I begin? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, the worst thing is, I think that the, <clears throat> the collapse of local news, at least in the U.S., because like I we lived in a small town, raised my kids in a small town in Connecticut, and they had a weekly, and it wasn't great reporting, it was maybe an editor and one reporter and one freelance mm -hmm. photographer, and it kept getting smaller. But then a, a media conglomerate bought the weekly and just closed it, just shut it. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to know, so sort of a, another publication sprung up that's online, but they don't go to every board meeting. And I mean, those things matter, right? Because mm -hmm. for this town, for example, like the school, the school budget was 90% of the town's budget, right? I mean, there wasn't a lot of, in, there was no industry, there was very little retail. So if you don't know what, who are the players and what's happening and what the issues are, then and there were crazy stories that happened too, but you know, then you you don't know. You know, then who knows? Because and that also is rely on their elections too, locally. Yes, yes. So it happened. Yeah, I did have the opportunity. I became editor about five years ago of a local regional paper, and it was really interesting to be in that newsroom. And in a way, everything changed, and in a way, nothing had changed. <laughs> it was both. <laughs> they were still trying to turn out stories, and there were beats. The kids. The reporters had beads, but what changed is that everything, and this is, I think, a danger, the, the, what, what I would tell what the, the philosophy was digital first. Mm. So if I was on the way to work and I saw a fire, my job was to pull over, record the fire and directly go on and put it on the newspaper's site. Mm -hmm before anyone read it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that happened, like we had a reporter who would cover the courts <laughs> and he was fine, but he always got like the defendant and the plaintiff kind of mixed up, you know? So I was always like, what did he write before I could read it? I was an assistant managing editor there. And then there's just the direction. There were at like six o'clock that this reporter who covered the police called me and said, hey, you know, the police just released a news release that there's an abandoned baby at this supermarket, this small supermarket. And I said, wow. I got it. So I put a reporter to write something up and she said, oh yeah, I wrote it as a brief. I said, no, no, this is not a brief. This is not a brief. <laughs> and I had to call the newspaper's headquarters and make sure it went on the front page with a jump. And then the next day on my way to work, I found out that, you know, NBC in New York City was out there in Danbury to cover that story. Mm. You know, so that reporter didn't know. And unless you have so my experience came in, you know, is important. Yeah. So you're doing a lot in the digital space now. And tell us about the medical show that you have been working on. As the pandemic struck, another mentor in media, Sri Srinivasan, who taught for Columbia, at Columbia for 20 years and covered emerging technology, online news, before anyone else was kind of covering it, and said he wanted, there was a conference, it was supposed to be on in person in Manhattan, and it became virtual in 10 days because of the pandemic. And during that conference, he told people, if anybody, I want to do a daily live stream show about the pandemic, about COVID. Is anyone interested? So like, <laughs> well, I, I am, you know. So suddenly I was covering, we did it on StreamYard. We had a global community. He's from India. So, and people, because they didn't ha have um, community, they would really, every day would tune in. And I started being on camera to interview people. 
So like from Maria Ressa, who I booked, you know, he might have introduced her. And then I was asking her more detailed questions that I was up on news and things like that. I probably did like 30 or 40 co-hosts. And one time I just hosted, he couldn't do it. Last minute, I jumped on a show with two Washington Post reporters. Uh, and then these two doctors wanted to do a show about medicine. These two, uh, two surgeons, prompt big surgeons in New York City. And so I was hired to help produce it and came up with the name of this show, which is called She's on Call. <laughs> because the doctors were always saying how, you know, no matter where they are, they're on call. They have families, they're for children, for their patients. And also like as a doctor, if they went to a rock concert, one of them told me that she went to a rock concert and the band leader like approached her afterwards. Somehow she was saying a great show or something and said, I have this mark on my back. Should I go see a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> so like it really fit because it was, and we interviewed, so it was an update. I was sort of keep track and update on COVID every show. And then we did all aspects of medicine and they wanted to dispel some of the myths that were, or the misinformation that was yes. occurring at the time. Which is still COVID. circulating. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's how I got involved in doing that. She's on call. And I also live tweeted for that show during every episode. And I started there. I created a Twitter account for them. That... So let's talk about women to follow. And you yes. found such a great niche there. So when did that idea come to you? And where do you want to see it go? The idea came about that I read a story from a group that called Gender Avenger, great name, that about how the reporters in DC, among the 3,300 reporters, like 82% of men followed and retweeted men, but the same percentage was true for women. And I thought like, that is crazy. And I just put out this tweet. I was exercising, put out this tweet saying, let's get this party started. I'm going to name three women to follow. And I tagged people from different fields, art, government, business. And that was it. I went to the library to write my story whatever I was working on. And my Twitter feed just exploded, right? So it was like, I came home that day and said, I think something happened on Twitter today. <laughs> and it kept going. You know, it had 12 million views. And I it was the guest on a few show, little live stream shows. And I saw that it resonated. And so I started to interview different women in different fields and did them as Twitter threads, which were still a little new at the time. Then during the pandemic, when I, I just had to like kind of give it up because I was so busy doing these live stream shows and also doing other work for this group called Digimentors, uh, you know, where we were taking a lot of event live events that were going that became virtual and said, oh, and people start. So those shows sort of wound down as the pandemic wound down and people then said, well, you could do your own woman to follow show. I said, I could, <laughs> you know, and so that was the idea. And I think there really is a need for women to speak out and to be seen because despite the gains we've made, we have so far to go. There's, women have so far to go in terms of a wage and getting the top positions at places and moving up in the ranks. I think there's a real niche and it, it's resonated. You know, people who I interviewed have said, well, I want my daughter to, when she looks up women in marketing, to know who are the leading women. Mm. So it's like leaving a legacy and building that name. And I mean, the name resonates, I think, with people. And where I want it to go, well, I just did a Woman to Follow Summit on February 28th in advance of Women to Women's History's Perspective. It was very good to do it when I did it because I did it the day before. Women's History Month. So I got much more attention. I knew how busy people get booked. Mm -hmm. I did have a sponsor for six months with my show, but then I felt like I needed some momentum to do something different. And with doing the summit, I had a sponsor and I got and a partner, which was a Zealous, which is a startup for media. 
I've gotten a lot of attention and I went on like eight or 10 shows. So I think where I wanted to go, one thing is to create a business and I've gone and have the domain name for Amplify Woman 365. Mm, I like that. Because what I discovered, of course, it really came home to me because during that month that I was being interviewed, people would say, well, what does Women's History Month mean to you? And I said, well, for me, Women's History Month is every day. You know, it's 365 days a year. And then I said, oh, well, that's kind of like interesting. So I can build programs like this for companies rather than them waiting for that one month. Because what I would, was seeing that month is that companies would sort of ride the bandwagon and say, oh, we have these 10 women who work for us in these different fields. But I had started to do that. I did a whole sort of highlighted three women, one man at Intel. And I did recorded interviews and then I did profiles and that are on their LinkedIn pages and stuff. So I think making, creating women to follow programs for particular, for any, and customizing them to anyone's, whether they want a written story, they want a recorded an interview to put on on YouTube, however they want it, I can build that. And that's one of the things I'm looking to do with Amplify Woman 365. So what's your favorite thing about what you're doing now? I would say the finding great women to follow, like discovering someone and saying, this woman has never been written about. And two, I think interviewing the woman, having that interview and and the back and forth and the conversation and then seeing also what the various women who I've interviewed what they're doing next they now have a two book deal or they've gone to you know xyz corporation and just the growth of seeing what these women do and keeping in touch with them rose thank you so much for thank being you. my guest it's so thank wonderful. you. Thank you, Debbie. It was really a pleasure. You asked really good questions. And, you know, I'm a tough critic. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. so it was really fun. Thank, thank you. you.